With me is Neurology Now Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Robin Bry. She is Fellow of the American Academy of Neurology, Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurology, and the Edna Smith Dealman Distinguished University Chair at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. Dr. Bry is speaking with patients and caregivers today um, at the Neurology Now booth at the 2014 Brain Health Fair in Philadelphia. Um, thank you very much for taking time to speak with us today, Dr. Bry. Um, maybe you could remind um, our audience or uh, share with the, the people who are new um, what area of neurology you specialize in. Well, I, um, I'm really a general neurologist. I see patients with all different kinds of neurological diseases. My research has been in trying to understand what causes problems in the brain in patients with uh, lupus. And um, would you describe for our audience also a little bit about what the Brain Health Fair is and why we uh, love to attend the event? Sure. So the Brain Health Fair is sponsored by the American Brain Foundation, the uh, foundation that's associated with the American Academy of Neurology. Um, the foundation really uh, had the idea of putting on one of these events uh, to kind of give back to the communities that we, uh, where we hold our meetings. And so this is our fourth annual uh, Brain Health Fair. We've brought together uh, neurologists, uh, neuroscientists. There are some residents and students here that are volunteering. There are events for children. Uh, and the idea really is to bring information about a variety of neurological diseases uh, to the people who live where we're having our meeting. It, it's a great event and um, you know there are it, it's really an exciting thing to be able to hear um, you know um, people like you you know who are you know experts in this field um, talk about what you do and talk about the latest research. I mean I, it, it's really it's a fantastic opportunity I, I think for people. Um, you know, it's interesting, speaking with um, Dr. Janice Miyasaki earlier, she said one of the other advantages of the Brain Health Fair is that um, young people who might be interested in becoming neurologists someday, it gives them an opportunity to hear and see what you all do. And it's been, it's been really fun. Um, at lunch today with some of the other volunteers, people who are volunteering are actually extremely excited about being here and interacting a lot of times one-on-one -on -one with the folks who come to the brain health fair so it's just it's just a really great really uplifting kind of mm -hmm. event both for those of us who are the volunteers putting on the event and for the people who attend um, so people might not know that the Ameri that the brain health fair is part of um, the American Academy of Neurology's annual meeting. Um, and this is um, an event where um, neurologists from all over the world attend to hear um, the latest research. Right. Um, and I thought you might share with our audience uh, some of the research that's come out of this particular meeting or that's being presented at the meeting that you think is of real interest for, for our readers, for, for patients and caregivers. De definitely. There is so much um, just really, really interesting and exciting work that's going to be discussed this year. The, Amer the um, American Academy of Neurology really officially kicks off tomorrow and goes through the whole next week here in Philadelphia. Um, there's a couple of sort of topics that I wanted to highlight. Uh, one pertains to traumatic brain injury. Um, there are actually two very interesting uh, uh, papers that are going to be presented here. One that actually looks at how useful helmets are in terms of protecting the brain of athletes, both professional athletes and kids. Um, and there's sort of good news and bad news in, in what's going to be presented. First, the good news is that the helmets that are currently being used um, in football, for example, are extremely good at preventing skull fracture. However, the bad news is they're not very good at preventing traumatic brain injury. And part of the reason for that is when uh, a player, an athlete, gets hit in the head, there are two types of forces that are really important in determining the, the type of injury that could occur. 
One is called linear acceleration, and that's the type of injury that leads to things like skull fracture or uh, bleeding in the brain. And so helmets are very good at, at preventing that. However, the second type, which is called uh, rotational force, is the type of uh, injury where the head is shifted. And when the head is moved suddenly to one direction or the other, the brain actually moves as well. And so uh, that type of injury uh, causes problems with the many uh, connections that, that are the networks that are connecting one part of the brain to the other. And when that happens, the brain doesn't work very well. The parts of the brain can't really talk to each other. And the uh, helmets that we currently use right now reduce the risk of that by only 20% compared to somebody with the same sort of injury without a helmet. So we have much, much more work to do to make uh, sports, football, um, soccer, et cetera, safer. Further, there's some work to show that um, in children, it's even worse type of situation if one of these injury occurs than um, in adults because children's brains are still forming and so these types of injuries can have much more long-lasting effects um, in kids. Um, would you also share with our audience um, some of the research um, into Alzheimer's disease and um, prevention strategies that are coming out of the uh, AAN meeting? Yes, there's several papers that are going to be presented looking at how important it is to control um, certain other diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, high cholesterol in preventing uh, the development of Alzheimer's uh, at a later point in life. So for example, there was, there was one group that looked at the effects of um, actually exercise in uh, middle age. And it's a very interesting paper that was, uh, that the, the research was started in 1985. And they collected information about this group of people and then just this past year brought them all back and, and did memory testing. And they found that the group of people who had consistently uh, kept up with this exercise program throughout their lifespan, starting it in middle age, were much less likely to have Alzheimer's disease later in life. So what's exciting about this is, um, number one, that's all something that we have under our own personal control, how we eat. Um, how we exercise, how well we keep our blood pressure under control. And all those things really do work. They really do work and um, give any of us uh, a much better chance of being healthy and having uh, a healthy brain uh, when we're uh, very elderly. Uh, you know, there, there are so many, here's, there are so many reasons um, to you know, keep uh, your weight uh, you know at a healthy um, uh, place. To exercise regularly. To you know to eat right. It's um you know it's it's encouraging to know that those things long term and and getting your numbers checked. You know your blood pressure, your you know your cholesterol. It's it's encouraging to know that those things are ways that you know we have some control over yeah. our long term cognitive health. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, and, and speaking of food, uh, I, I think there was also um, uh, one study that, that came out, is coming out of this meeting um, that had to do with uh, vitamin C, is yes. that correct? Yes, so there was um, a, a research uh, study that was done by, by a group that's going to be presenting here that found that vitamin C was protective against developing uh, a, a very uh, less common but potentially much more devastating type of stroke called uh, a hemorrhagic stroke. And so again, um, what we eat, uh, how we care for our bodies in general really is extremely important.
Um, and sort of shifting now a little bit um, from these kinds of lifestyle, um, important lifestyle modifications to um, uh, more uh, the kind of neuroscience that, that uh, uh, the kinds of studies that people think of as the forefront of neuroscience, I understand that there's also some, some research related to stem cells um, and to their use in, um, in neurologic conditions. Um, and uh, I thought you might speak a little bit about that and also um, uh, let people know, you know, how, maybe you'd also talk a little bit about how, how long it can take for, for good treatments to, to reach what they call prime time, to be mm -hmm. ready for people to see them and to be used. Sure. So, you know, when, when most people hear the word stem cell, they think of the controversial fetal stem cell work. And actually, at this point in time, very little of that is actually being done. So now the field has moved forward to the point where uh, scientists can take skin cells from individual people and um, they can grow those skin cells in a, in a dish in the lab. Using certain chemicals, they can induce those skin cells to turn into stem cells that they can use another set of chemicals to induce those stem cells to turn into brain cells. It's incredible. And then they can actually look at how the brain cells from a single individual, so my brain cells behave, and how they um, grow and how they metabolize things and whether they have any abnormalities. So, so we have actually a way of looking at a person's brain by culturing their skin cells. Amazing. And new therapies are being um, developed. So for example, if, if they find that my brain cells have a certain abnormality and we can figure out how to fix that, they can fix it in those brain cells in the dish put those brain cells back in my brain, and in some cases, that can benefit me and make me better. Um, uh, so it's, it's just incredible. It's, it's extremely, extremely uh, powerful what, what's being done. Now, in terms of how long it takes to, to get a therapy like that to prime time, um, many, 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 many years. So there's no one who I, uh, is, is doing uh, large clinical trials yet using that type of approach. Uh, there's a couple of studies that are getting geared to begin uh, human trials. The, the things that I've been explaining about the stem cells have largely from a therapeutic standpoint been done in animal models. But there's some very robust data from, uh, for, for a whole variety of neurologic conditions, um, ALS, um, multiple sclerosis, uh, the leukodystrophies, Huntington's disease, uh, some of the cerebellar ataxias, and then there are some human studies, not using a person's own stem cells, but, but using um, stem cells that are, uh, are sort of manufactured in the lab to try to improve stroke recovery. And there are uh, trials in people where, where that approach is being taken. But none of this is something that a doctor in the hospital can order at this point. I see. Um, and if, if someone wa was interested in participating in a clinical trial, um, where would they, um, what are some ways that they could find, um, you know, appropriate clinical trials for them to participate in? Well, the um, NIH has a website, uh, clinicaltrials.gov, that can be, uh, that, that a person could go to. Um, I think uh, that that would be a, a good place to start. Can a person ask their neurologist? Yes. I mean about that kind of absolutely that kind of information too. Absolutely. Um, if if you're interested in participating in a clinical trial, really the first place you can certainly do some research online, but talking to your neurologist about it is always a good idea. 
Um, well, thank you very much for uh, taking time to speak with us sure. today, Dr. Bry. Um, to uh, find out more about the research coming out of the AAN um, and to read uh, Dr. Bry's from the editor, uh, go to www.neurologynow.com.